This week at Starbase, we watched in anticipation as SpaceX's preparations finally wound down and they launched the eighth flight test of Starship and Super Heavy. Even though not quite everything went according to plan, in typical fashion, excitement was guaranteed and delivered. Now let's dig into this week's update. Starting things off this week, Booster 16 was brought to the Massey Outpost early on Friday morning for its first round of cryogenic testing. A water deluge storage tank for Pad B was brought to the launch site, stopping outside the D2 gate. The delivery vehicle was swapped for SpaceX's own self-propelled transporter, then brought into the launch site. Crews were back to work on Booster 15's flight termination system. Workers spent about two hours working on the FTS box. We also saw some Tesla Mega Packs that were staged at the Starhopper parking lot. These grid-scale battery systems will provide backup power to the launch site. Eight engine shielding panels were unloaded at the build site for installation on Super Heavy Booster. The Pad B water tank was moved into place, poking around near the flame trench before it was positioned on the left side of the tower. Initial testing of the tank farm expansion began, with venting coming from the cryo lines and frosty vaporizers. SpaceX's crane was repositioned at the launch site, stopping by Pad B for some last-minute work before laying down. Once there, the crane was used to remove one of the lateral hard stops from the Pad B chopsticks. Each arm has one of these, and they prevent the arms from closing too far. Starship's 32 detailed nose cone was brought out of High Bay and taken over to Sanchez for scrapping. Booster 16 began its first round of cryo testing in the evening as its methane tank was filled with liquid nitrogen. After being held full for about an hour, the booster was slowly detanked over the next several hours. The drawworks hoist for Pad B was put through its paces, moving the chopsticks up and down in small, repeated motions before lowering them back down to the hard stop. Crews then began inspecting the chopstick carriage afterward, possibly taking a look at the skates. Another storage tank was delivered early on Saturday morning. Repeating the process with the previous tank, the transporters were swapped and the tank was rolled in on SpaceX's transporter. Additional venting capacity was added to the tank farm, with the new ventilation stack installed in the thick fog. Following the tests on Friday, the lateral hard stop was lifted and reinstalled on the Tower 2 chopsticks. At the same time, the second water tank was moved into place. The ship transport stand was brought into Mega Bay 2 to pick up Ship 34 ahead of its trip to the launch site. The Starlink simulators joined the transport stand at Mega Bay 2 for installation in the ship. Workers ended up removing a lateral hard stop from the Pad B chopsticks again, although it wasn't immediately clear if it was the same one or if it was the opposite. The Buckner and SpaceX on-site cranes both lowered their booms ahead of Flight 8, protecting the cranes from the vibration and the potential debris. A parade of road-ready heavy equipment left the launch site and headed up Highway 4 to wait out the launch. Back at the build site, the Starlink loader was lifted into place. Two crossbars were then loaded into the ship. Once the crossbars were in place, the dummy satellites were loaded into the ship and the loader was removed. Crews then installed the two dummy catch points on Sunday morning to study how re-entry will affect the real catch hardware in future flights. With all satellites on board now, Ship 34's payload bay was closed. The door's action is much smoother than the previous design and should operate much better in space. Ship 34 rolled out of Mega Bay 2 after sunrise, holding in the ring yard ahead of its rollout to the launch pad. The ship began its rollout a few hours later, turning down Highway 4 and heading to the launch site. Ship 34 was then taken in through the front gate and brought over to Pad A and the chopsticks. The Starship was eventually placed between the chopsticks, following a false start a few hours earlier. The tower ship quick disconnect arm was retracted, and the chopsticks were soon raised up and attached to the ship lifting points. A few hours later, Starship 34 was stacked on Booster 15, just in time for their launch attempt on Monday. The ship and booster transport stands were sent back to the build site, arriving together early on Monday morning. One half of a super heavy downcomer was delivered to the build site as work continues to construct multiple boosters for future flights. The Pad A chopsticks and landing rails were raised into the catch position and configured for launch. 
A quick detonation suppression system test was performed to make sure the pad systems were ready. A few tests of the chopstick systems also verified that the tower was ready for catching operations. Next, the tank farm began spooling up, preparing for propellant load, which began in earnest a bit over an hour later, filling the ship and booster with almost 5,000 tons of liquid oxygen and methane. The launch attempt was aborted, however, after issues were found in both the ship and booster's liquid oxygen temperatures, and the booster spin start gas system failed to reach flight pressure. The ship transport stand was brought back to the launch site for destacking of the ship and booster. A short while later, the ship quick disconnect arm was retracted from ship 34 for D-stack. Starship 34 was then lifted off booster 15 and set down on the ship stand. The next two days would be spent working the issues in the ship and booster ahead of the flight on Thursday. Booster 16 underwent a second round of cryo testing at the Massey outpost, this time focused on the liquid oxygen tank. There was some impressive vending after the tank was filled and the booster was eventually drained. Starship 36 aft section featuring the aft flaps forward mounting hinge and tank access port was brought into Mega Bay 2 for stacking. Decommissioning of the high bay continued with the removal of a turntable from the bay. The work table was taken out of the build site and sent up Highway 4 to parts unknown. The chopstick stabilizer and lift pins were engaged with Ship 34 on Wednesday morning as crews got ready to restack the ship and booster. The stacking operation began a few minutes later. The lift did not go smoothly though, with the tower's carriage appearing to seize at several points during the lift. When the ship was set down over the booster, the chopsticks fell out of alignment, breaking a piece off of one of the three hot stage adapter clamps. Two hours later, the ship was lowered back down for crews to assess the situation. Crews were soon on top of the hot stage adapter to check out the affected clamp. The missing piece was a bumper pad on the clamp's guide tab, and the clamp itself was just fine. With that, the decision was made to resume stacking. However, the lift stopped shortly after it began due to an apparent issue with the chopsticks, stranding the ship partway up the tower. Teams inside the tower began to work the problem out, and a few minutes later, the issue was addressed and Ship 34 was set on Booster 15. The ship quick disconnect was attached to Ship 34 and the stack was ready. Early on Thursday morning, the ship transport stand was sent back to the build site. Once it arrived, it was taken to the rocket garden at Sanchez. The detonation suppression system was tested on the launch mount once again in the morning as the final preparations for flight began. Five hours before liftoff, the chopsticks were reopened and raised to the launch position. The ship lifting pins were retracted and the landing rails were raised. These rails help cushion the booster when it touches down. As the count proceeded, the propellant supply lines were conditioned while the tank farm began to spool up. Propellant loading began at T-50 minutes, rapidly filling the ship and booster with thousands of tons of fuel and liquid oxygen. At 5.30 p.m., after a short 30-second hold, Booster 15's 33 Raptor 2 engines roared to life, lifting off the pad into the South Texas skies and arcing over the Gulf. The initial ascent went flawlessly with all engines burning for the full duration, followed by a successful hot staging and separation. The boost back burn saw 11 out of 13 engines relight, but the booster remained on course and made its way back to the launch site. After the 11 engine boost back burn, booster 15 made a 12 engine braking burn, followed by a successful catch on the thrust of the Super Heavy's three center engines. This marks the third successful recovery of the Super Heavy booster. This booster's descent exposed the tower to the rocket's exhaust less than previous flights in an apparent effort to improve the operational life of the tower. SpaceX also hopes to reuse Booster 15 in a future flight. Meanwhile, Starship 34's ascent proceeded nominally until about eight minutes into the flight when one of the vacuum raptors exploded, taking out the sea level engines and leaving the ship spinning out of control off the coast of Florida. The flight termination system activated shortly afterward and its debris re-entered over the Bahamas. 
A mishap investigation is now underway as workers begin to root out the cause of the failure. At the tank farm, several of the newly installed vaporizers were affected. One particularly damaged unit was no longer vertical after being subjected to the forces of the launch. Amid the damage, crews began lowering Booster 15 back into the launch mount. The booster needed to be safed after flight before it could be brought back to the build site. Once the road was reopened, the booster transport stand began heading to the launch site and was taken to Pad A to pick up the returned Super Heavy. Back at the build site, the transfer tube installation jig with a full set of fuel transfer tubes was moved over to Ship 36 in the evening. Interestingly, these lines were redesigned for Starship V2 and the individual feed tubes to the Vacuum Raptor may well be the culprit of the last two ship failures. After the fuel lines were installed, the header tank liquid oxygen supply line was added to Ship 36. This week at the Cape saw Bob return to Port Canaveral on Friday morning, carrying fairing halves 200 and 185 from the Starlink Group 12-13 mission. Signet Warhorse 3 returned a few hours later, towing home Just Read the Instructions and Booster 1092 from its first successful launch. The Falcon 9 was soon taken off the recovery ship and set down on the dockside stand. Just Read the Instructions headed back out to sea just a few hours later, getting ready for the Starlink Group 12-20 launch. Doug joined Bob back in port in the evening, carrying fairing halves 212 and 203 from the Intuitive Machines 2 launch. The lander successfully touched down on the moon on Thursday, but like its predecessor, it tipped over on landing. Signet Lightning brought a short fall of Gravitas and Booster 1083 back from the IM-2 mission about an hour later. A bit later, Bob departed in support of the Starlink Group 12-20 launch. Booster 1083 was offloaded from a short fall of Gravitas on Saturday and set down at the docks. A short fall of Gravitas set out once more on Sunday, heading out to support the Starlink Group 12-21 launch. Falcon 9 Booster 1086 lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40, carrying the Starlink Group 12-20 mission into orbit. This would be the booster's final mission due to a failure after landing. Doug headed out to sea to join a short fall of Gravitas in support of the upcoming Starlink launch. Booster 1092 finished its stay at the Port Canaveral docks on Monday and was laid on a horizontal transport for its first trip to Roberts Road for post-flight activities. Bob brought back both fairing halves from the Starlink Group 12-20 mission on Tuesday. The next morning, the support ship headed out to rendezvous with Just Read the Instructions as it made its return to port with the remains of Booster 1086. Signet Warhorse 3 returned to Port Canaveral, towing the recovery ship with what was left of the aft section of Booster 1086. One of the legs caught fire when it landed, and the leg eventually failed, causing the booster to tip over and explode. Falcon 9 Booster 1083 finished its stay at the dock on Thursday and was laid down for transport back to Roberts Road. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you haven't already, guys, and we'll see you next week. Thanks for watching. Lab Padre out.